is Service Headline News, and I'm your host, Marty Smith, and I'm joined by our historian, Eric Perron. What's going on, gentlemen? And our man in the closet, Jake Wall. Marty, that was a very, like, enthusiastic <laughs> intro. I appreciate that. And we're here to bring you the latest headlines and updates pertinent to all servicemen and women. So, take your seats, get informed, and have a laugh as the Swearing in Podcast presents Service Headline News. You got me all hyped up for you. Like, kick it off, baby. Like, all right. Kick it off. What can I? It's <laughs> sunny down here tonight. I'm kicking it. Uh, nice. How's your week, gentlemen? Out freaking standing. I don't want to hear from the retiree on how good your week was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jeez. It's all golf courses and sunshine. I, you know. uh, uh, I, I will just say it's still highly recommended. I did. I did. Before you came on, Jake, I asked Eric, I was like, so are you getting into a rhythm? He's like, every day is roses, baby. <laughs> oh, man. Tell him what you nice. did today. Tell him what you did, retiree. Oh, uh, let's see. Started on the deck on the sunshine with a cup of coffee. Well, I had tea. My wife had coffee. Had a nice conversation. Had a 1030 golf lesson at Golf Tech. Tough day. <laughs> we went to lunch with a buddy of mine at DTC. Um Came over. We we've got friends, family in from Iowa, so we were over at uh, uh, Top Golf today this afternoon, and then I had a nice workout in the gym, prepped yeah. for my uh, podcast. You know, yeah, set. that sounds like a tough prep. Yeah, so, it was so it was hard, jealous. man. I'm so jealous. And Marty, he he has no time to contribute any news articles. So. Well, that's a full day. Well, yeah, no, but why? Call. Why, why like back, back up the train? That's a good closet that's guy. Good. Maybe maybe <laughs> while he was getting driven back up the, the train, shot, like, guy. Shot, they were looking <laughs> off in the corner trying to find his golf shot. <laughs> he couldn't have been like, "Hey now, Siri, now why do you think I'm military news? Now why do you think I'm taking golf lessons, bro? Come on, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I know. You got to drive all the way over to your shot in the bushes. Uh, uh, mm. oh, good though, good. It's very good. Jake, you got a break between exercises? Oh, yeah, we're doing good. I got a I got a break right now. I'm I am leaving to go home though to do some housework and hang out with the mother for a while. That's um, we got, with yeah, with the kids. So nice, nice. Big news is though, I did get a coffee mug on Father's Day. Oh. And, it, and it and it shows exactly what my kids think of me. Because it didn't <laughs> say number one dad, my favorite uncle. Number one, grandma. It said, "Coffee makes me poop." <laughs> <laughs> I've never been so proud. <laughs> That's awesome. The next oh, generation. The next generation. You're raising them right, <laughs> Jake. You're raising them right. Oh, uh, yep. Speaking of generations, kick us off with our day in history, Eric. Fellas, I got a surprise for you tonight. Oh. I have a U.S. Those three. Uh, and I have one from overseas that I thought was important that I, I wanted to bring it up to you guys to have a small conversation with. There was a battle. It took place in 1815, June 18th. Any ideas? This was in Europe. In 1815, we took a little trip. Yeah, and that's that the not song? It. No, that's pretty not sure it. that's what it is. Right. That's not it. Oh, who, who sang it? One of those guys sang that song about it. Uh, no. One of your favorite musicians <laughs> sang a song about this. I don't know what you're talking about. ABBA. <laughs> Waterloo. <laughs> that could go. <laughs> Did you have time to Google it or what? <laughs> I just, just did that to note. mess with you. I did research today just to be like, oh, Eric's going to have some dumb shit today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get him. Uh, you blew me out of the water. Oh. Waterloo. The Battle of Waterloo, the decisive battle that took place uh, near Waterloo, uh, Belgium. It was fought between the French army, led by Napoleon Bonaparte, and the combined forces of the British army under the Duke of Wellington. So, big failure on Mr. Napoleon. So, I thought I'd bring that up. Kind of an important date. So, our day in history took place June 19th through the 20th, 1944 was a large, large carrier battle. Any ideas? 
1944. June of 1944. Large carrier Mid- versus carrier engagement. Well, it could have been Midway because that was yeah, earlier. Yeah, Midway? Nope, not Midway. Midway was earlier, right? Yeah. Not yep, Midway. Not me. Good. The Battle of the Philippine Sea. Oh, Oh, that one. Oh. <laughs> major, major naval battle of World War II that eliminated the Imperial Japanese Navy's ability to conduct large-scale carrier actions. That's big. It took place during the United States amphibious invasion of the Mariana Islands during the Pacific War. Was that the Japanese last two carriers um, in that battle? Yes. it was. That's what stopped them. This was the last carrier engagement. Uh, It pitted elements of the United States Navy's fifth element against ships of an aircraft of the Imperial Japanese Naval Mobile Fleet and nearby island garrisons. This was the largest carrier-to-carrier battle in history involving 24 aircraft carriers deploying roughly 1,350 carrier-based aircraft. Yeah, now that's on both sides. Remember... We're talking little ones. They have, you know, littler size. Oh, than, those little jump ones. Yeah. yeah. So there was a bunch of them. And uh, if you'll recall, the battle became the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot by the American aviators. Oh, so really? huge I battle. Yeah. The aerial part of the battle was nicknamed the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot by American aviators for the severely disproportional loss ratio inflicted upon Japanese aircraft by American pilots. Mm. What what allowed them to uh what, what what were the conditions that it was a turkey shoot? The overwhelming um amount of aircraft to theirs. Oh, okay. Yeah. During a debriefing after the first two air battles, a pilot from USS Lexington remarked, "Why the hell?" It was just like an old turkey shoot down home. The outcome is generally attributed to a wealth of highly trained American pilots with superior tactics and numerical superiority. And one last piece, new anti-aircraft ship defensive technology, including the top secret anti-aircraft proximity fuse. That's first I'd heard of that, but that was uh, improvement on their anti-aircraft guns on the ship. Air bursting, uh, air to air air bursts, probably because right? a proximity fuse doesn't need a direct hit. It's just, oh, I'm close, I'm exploding. You know what's funny yep. is battles like such as Midway and a couple of the others where we were severely outflown. They were knocking us down right constantly, right. and then in this thing, the total reverse. Well, uh, Midway. Uh, we caught them trying to change between dive bombing and uh, air to air torpedoes. Torpedoes. So right? they had a whole big force that we caught on the deck and destroyed a whole bunch of them there. So that was that was fortunate. Well, um, and after those battles too, it left the Japanese longing for new pilots. The replace- yeah, replacement right. pilots. Right. They didn't have any flight hours and training, little to no combat experience. Yeah, so they I were think, they were I getting think- their butts kicked. I think I read something about like the kamikaze guys. They were just training them to take off. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if that's true or not, but it's just like, hey, what about landing? Like, don't worry about that. We'll get yep. to that. <laughs> I don't I I think they knew it. You volunteered for that uh kamikaze uh squadron and you knew you were gonna be dead. Sure. When you go into forty four and forty five and you see both Germany and Japan, they're just down to the drakes, right? I mean, they're yeah. they got the boys fighting, you know, they're they don't have uh, all the vehicles anymore. Japanese didn't have all the planes anymore, so yeah. uh, it's, it's wild. You know what? You know what also strikes me is <clears throat> you told me who was the commander who said it was like a old down home turkey shoot. Turkey shoot. <laughs> oh, let's see. It didn't give his name. <clears throat> well, I was watching a documentary on uh, Bastogne and how they got uh, surrounded, and I can't remember the commander's name of the 101st that was in there. And they, and the German commander he said, said nuts. He said nuts. And nuts. Like, that became infamous. The turkey shoot became infamous. Yeah. Uh, all these kind of old Southern sayings, you know, that just off the cuff of these generals became all these famous, you know, rally cry things that they said. If you had <laughs> Schwarzkopf 
you know, during Gulf mm-hmm. War or uh, uh, Powell just fly off and say something like that. They'd be like, this guy's fucking crazy. And I say think something like that. I think most of the troops that, that understood what your general said at, at Bastogne at Bestoin or whatever the hell it is with nuts was like, what the hell does that even mean? Right. It right. doesn't have a meaning. Right. Uh, uh, that was kind of strange. I mean, I mean, I, it, it does make me wonder how many uh, translators the Germans went through to go, why does it say nuts? That makes no sense. <laughs> Shoot that guy. Get me another one. <laughs> it says nuts too. What are you doing? <laughs> I can only imagine. Oh, I mean, I mean I, 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 they can't get that colloquialism, right? Ah. So, uh, okay. I thought you were really going to go with Waterloo. I was going to be so pissed at you. But you no, <laughs> oh no, no, no. Learn my lesson. <laughs> Good catch, Jake. You would have got I gotta grounded. tell you. I gotta tell you, Jake. Now, if I'm we didn't impressed. have copyright issues, we could play Waterloo for you. Yeah, for I'm just a big ABBA fan. That's all it is. <laughs> Swedish supergroup, baby. That was awesome. <laughs> uh okay. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Yes, sir. Uh, let's go. Now, this is a this article actually came out. It's not really news. It came out in January, um, but it caught my eye. So going along right after our historian, this uh, website called wearethemighty.com. And every once in a while, they got some good stuff. A lot of it's all historical, uh, but it's, it's pretty interesting uh, articles. Wearethemighty.com. So they had a story about the 10 most intense battles of uh, American history. Um, Now, they didn't really define what intense means, um, but basically it's kind of like casualties plus the amount of fighting. And I think as as we read down through this, you'll you'll be like, oh, yeah, that seems... Rounds fired. Yeah, yeah. So the first one they list is the Battle of Chosan. Oh, yeah. Chosen Reservoir. Is it Chosen or Chosan? I don't know how to pronounce it. It's Chosen. Because they always did the Frozen Chosen. But I don't know if Chosen was pronounced Chosen. But anyway, Korea War (laughs) Battle. Now that I know my daughter listens to it, I I better explain this a little bit more for any civilians who listen to it, right? So (laughs) Chosan was a Korean War battle. And basically MacArthur had did his landing up north and was cutting off the North Korean force and was about to encircle them when all of a sudden the Chinese communists came over the border and attacked them, the U S 10th yeah. Corps and forced yeah. them to retreat. Uh, and this was no mid November. Uh, the first Marine Div- division and elements of the seventh infantry division found themselves surrounded, outnumbered and at risk of annihilation in the high North Korean mountains at the Chosan reservoir. The only way out was a fighting retreat back to the coast. Um, so they were trying to withdraw, trying to withdraw. God, over the course of the next 17 days, the Marines and soldiers fought the Chinese and Ooh. bouts of frostbite with fierce determination and epic endurance. Uh, they broke through the enemy's encirclement and even rebuilt a bridge the Chinese destroyed using pre-built bridge sections dropped by the yep. Air Force. By the end of the battle. You're welcome, Marines. <laughs> <laughs> All you had to do was call. We could have been right. All you had to do is survive 17 days of running away That's while right. shooting, and we'll hook you up with yeah, a plastic. We'll, we'll put a bridge down for bridge. you. That's the least we could do. You know, the worst part about that whole thing was MacArthur was advised by the president, no less, that the Chinese would cross and get involved in the war. And he said, no way. They're well, not going to do that. I don't know. It's a tough one because his he essentially, ego. with that landing, uh, MacArthur essentially won the war against the North Koreans. I mean, we had their force and sir. I mean, it was done. A lot of people will tell you that Chosan was a lost battle for us. It was a lost battle. Uh, well, yeah. that's my point. Just yeah. because it was a, a retreat. <laughs> a retreat. Eric, it was definitely an L. Okay. It was an L. You don't want to hear my talk. <laughs> No, 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 go ahead. No, seriously. I'm just saying, when you say he won that battle. No, no, no. I, I, I said he, when he landed his force there and encircled the North Koreans, that was yeah. essentially done for the North Koreans. 
Well, and that's yeah, when the Chinese so, crossed over until the Chinese yeah, got That's involved. what I'm talking about. The, against oh, okay. the North Koreans, we had <laughs> okay. essentially won that conflict until the agree. Chinese crossed over. I would agree. So it's hard It's hard to say, <clears throat> yes, he was too bold uh, and maybe should have heeded the Listen. intelligence at the time. Correct. But, uh, I mean, with that one stroke, because the North Koreans weren't expecting it, he landed and he, had, you know, it was like, it was doomsday for North Koreans. Well, and, and that's also... Sudden, uh, what helped create the 38th parallel on their retreat. Right. Yeah, right, right. Uh, by the end of the battle, the U.S. Marines suffered 836 dead and roughly 10,000 wounded. Jeez, dude. The Army had 2,000 dead and 1,000 wounded because they had a smaller force there with them. Yeah. Uh, the Chinese had the most catastrophic losses. Six out of their 10 divisions were wiped out. Mm. And only one would ever see combat again. That part I did not know. It didn't seem like they took that many uh, casualties. I know our, our our air strafed the hell out of them. Well, those numbers are a guess, too, because there's not an accurate. <laughs> they are, right. And yeah. it says, although exact numbers are not known, historians estimate that anywhere between thirty and 80,000 Chinese were killed. That's a pretty large swing Ooh, for yeah. an estimation. It's like, eh, roughly 30 to, <laughs> you know, usually you go maybe 30, 35, 37. And they're like 30 to 80. Thousand. I think that the doctrine for the Chinese army was slightly flawed when it blow your whistle and rush man over man. Yeah, that's true. They were, they were all guns. frontal assault. Yeah, they yeah. were just uh, wave body wave waves. after wave. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Um, so although technically a loss from the Marines, the Battle of Chosan Reservoir lives on in memory as an example of the Marine fighting spirit. I would agree. I would agree. So the next one they talk about is the Battle of Antietam. A year and a half into the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln needed a Union victory. Because, yeah, Union was getting their ass kicked for the for the first couple of years of that. Um, Lincoln charged Major General George B. McClellan with the defense of Washington, D.C. against Confederate General Robert E. Lee's first invasion of the North. Earlier in the month, Lee divided his men, sending General Thomas Stonewall Jackson to capture Harper's Ferry. Following Jackson's success, Lee decided to make a stand in Maryland at Antietam Creek. After two days of posturing, fighting began early in the morning of September 17, 1862, and lasted well past sundown. Hmm. With staggering casualties on both sides and no ground gained. The next day, both armies hmm. gathered their dead and wounded, and Lee retreated south. It was the bloodiest one-day battle in American history with... 23,000 casualties from both sides and nearly 4,000 dead. And that was a huge turning point for the Union, that, for their favor. <clears throat> right, It was, a, and it was a stalemate. Yeah. But it, they didn't lose. So it's like, yeah. it's crazy. <laughs> then they talk about Battle of Gettysburg is next. Um, I don't want to re uh, really yeah. uh, recap Gettysburg. I mean, there's movies, there's everything else on yeah. there. Um, let's see, does it say <laughs> casualties were high on both sides. The Union suffered around 23,000 casualties while the South suffered 28,000, more than a third of Lee's army. So Boy, the Civil a, War was an intro of true killing. And how can we kill better? Well, and, it, but it was also, uh, it would also seem like somebody would go, Hey, maybe these Napoleonic tactics aren't the best. Yeah, stand in line, fire Once you get a other. straight line, and yeah. uh, if the guy falls in front of you, just step over him because we're still going. So it's crazy, yeah. crazy. Um, then I get into this one, Hue City. I was like, oh, Vietnam. Hue City, again, another uh, Marine battle. Uh, North Vietnamese captured the venerated capital city of Hue during the Tet Offensive. Uh, the battle... To regain way began in February 68 and lasted nearly a month as Marines ferociously drove North Vietnamese and Communist Viet Cong forces from the city. Uh, let's see. I wonder what I, kind of comparisons you could find between the Battle of Way and the Battle of Fallujah. Well, interesting you say that because the Battle ah. of Fallujah is in here. Ah, very cool. Um, <clears throat> so they retook it on February 24th. Uh, on March 2nd, the longest sustained infantry battle the war had seen to this point was officially declared over. So that was March 2nd, and it started 
on uh, Fe- in February. Jesus. So uh, the U.S. suffered 216 dead and 1,364 wounded. South Vietnamese mm-hmm. losses totaled 384 dead and 1,830 wounded, with thousands of civilians caught in the crossfire or murdered. The North Vietnamese casualties included 5,000 dead and countless more wounded. Virtually all of Way City was destroyed, leaving roughly 100,000 homeless. And, you know, whenever you see uh, the depictions of the fighting or you see some of those old films and stuff, it's always mm-hmm. just like troops running through the streets and nobody else is there. You know, yeah. you kind of don't remember. I, I didn't realize that 100,000 Vietnamese lived in that city when it was attacked. We're still there. Yeah. We're still Steal there. Yeah. yeah. It was like, yeah. Dang. So, Eric, number sure. five, number five on this list <laughs> is the Second Battle of Fallujah. Ah, okay. Oh, second Battle of Fallujah was the bloodiest battle American troops fought in the entire Iraqi conflict, and the deadliest battle for the Marine Corps since Way City in '68. <laughs> oh, so there is a comparison. Yeah, and it was almost well. Yeah, it wasn't quite the same time frame. That the other one was February to March. This one was from November through December 2004. The joint American, British, and Iraqi government offensive fought to clear the insurgents from the their Anbar province stronghold. An estimated 4,000 enemy combatants were in the city when the fighting began. It's even suspected that Al-Qaeda terrorist Abu Musab al-Zarqawi held his headquarters there. They fortified their defenses before the attack, preparing spider holes, traps, and concealed IEDs throughout the town. They created propane bombs hidden in buildings, hidden in buildings, cut off ask, access to escape routes and roofs, and designed fields of fire where they believed coalition forces would maneuver. Nearly 70% of the civilian population fled the city, reducing civilian casualties and allowing coalition forces to launch their assault. Army, Marine, and Iraqi forces attacked with an air barrage, followed by an assertion of Marines and Navy Seabees who bulldozed obstacles. Can you imagine those guys? Yeah, Ooh. you're a construction worker in I a dri- war zone. I drive this uh, <laughs> <laughs> tractor <laughs> back here. They're like, get on the truck. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you know, that had a great operational name. You know what that was? What? Phantom Fury. Oh, that's pretty good. Operation Phantom Fury. Ooh, that's <laughs> better than Urgent Fury. That's true. And way better than Nimrod Dancer. So. <laughs> uh, by the end of December, 82 U.S. troops were killed with another 600 wounded. British and Iraqi forces sustained 12 killed with another 53 wounded. Over 2,000 insurgents were killed while another 1,200 were captured. Hmm. So... Uh, this next one they have is the Battle of Sangin. I don't know how to pronounce that. S A N G I N. Sangin. Was that uh, that was Vietnam too, right? No, this one was uh, enduring freedom. So, oh. Okay. Battle of Sangin was one of the deadliest campaigns in Operation Enduring Freedom. The Sangin River Valley was a Taliban stronghold and was considered the center of opium production. In 2010, the United States Marines replaced the British forces in Sangin and initiated a deadly campaign to clear out the insurgent presence in the region. The counterinsurgency lasted for four years, and during this time, Marines sustained casualties at some of the highest rates seen during the 17-year conflict in Afghanistan. Wow. By 17 20, years. By 2012, Sangin was transformed from a battlefield into a thriving rural town, but the price was over... 100 British and American lives lost and hundreds more wounded. The Taliban continue to fight for Sangin, and today the area remains in contention. Well, it's theirs now. You know, it's, it's yeah. all back to the Taliban now. So, never knew about that battle. I, I've heard about Fallujah. You know, and, uh, it's interesting that that was, it seems so recent, but all these big major operations are still kind of like, oh, I think I heard of that one, or I think yeah. I heard of that one. Yeah. Uh, why don't we know more about some of these bigger battles things? So maybe if we ever get General Chris Petty on, he can uh, he can that would be some awesome. Of those major battles, yeah. Uh, okay, opera uh, number seven, Operation Bolo. You ever hear of that one? I have not. This is the only air-to-air fight uh, on this list. It's a it's decidedly less deadly. 
plot, the tactics, and implications of merit discussion. Operation Bolo was the biggest air battle in the Vietnam War and one of the most successful ambush actions in military history. In hmm. the last months of 66, the North Vietnamese Army's MiG-21 Fishbed Fleet had become... Th- those are the dumbest names they gave them, right? The flogger, <laughs> the fish bed. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why we named it that, because who's afraid of a fish bed? <laughs> right? Who's afraid yeah. of a flogger, you know? I mean, the ba- the bombers were all like bears, I think, or something like that. But yeah, their, their early MiG fighters had the dumbest names. So, Farmer... Uh, Unless, unless you unless you come up with uh, what was it Firefox? Remember Firefox? Was that the Clint Eastwood? That was one? Clint Eastwood movie. <laughs> Where he had to yeah, it, it, it like read his mind to do things. Didn't he plane. steal like an SR seventy one? It was essentially like an SR seventy one. Yeah. yeah, he had to give orders in Russian for the plane to. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He had to yeah. think in Russian. Yeah. Right, think right, in right, Russian right. or say it in Russian or something yep. like that. So, um. That's a pretty big risk. You're like, I don't know if my Russian's that great. You know, like, <laughs> That's funny. What did I tell it to do? Um, so anyway, so, the, uh, go. So Marty, just sorry, really quick. That um, that Sangin Valley, that Afghanistan, that Afghan Valley yeah. battle. Yeah. Have you seen that documentary Restrepo? Yes, I have. Is that it, in there? It, it's not, but I mean, if you want to think about Restrepo and then shift that upwards involving U.S. and British. And yeah. yeah, that's good. Point. Just imagine what that kind of fight would have been. Well, I thought one of the better ones is the outpost. I mean, yeah. at least recently, if you've seen the yeah. outpost. And I was like, that that's a pretty good depiction of like just waves coming at these guys. It was like, God dang. So, okay, Operation Bolo. Uh, in the last months of 66, the North Vietnamese Army's MiG-21 fleet had become more active and successful at intercepting the F-105 Thunder Chief formations of the United States Air Force. Uh, the F-105s were supersonic fighter bombers. Uh, they did this in the role of the Wild Weasels, a group that would fly slow yeah. and low enough to bait the communist surface-to-air systems into targeting them, thus giving away the enemy position and allowing the Wild Weasels to attack and destroy. But with the MiG-21... but with the MiG-21 added to the fight, the F-105s were falling vulnerable to air-to-air attacks. The U.S. Air Force decided they needed to neutralize the MiG threat. Air Force legend and World War II ace, Colonel Robin Olds, designed a gut- gutsy plan to accomplish this, known as Operation Bolo. The mission was to lure the enemy MiGs into battle by hiding supersonic F-4C jets among the slower and less maneuverable F-105s. Uh, on January second, nineteen sixty-seven, Olds and his formation of Phantoms took to the took to the skies to fly the F one hundred five bomb run. They kept to the F one hundred five speed and flew in the F one hundred five formation. The MBA took the bait and engaged, and then popping up from the clouds, the MiG twenty ones were attacked in pairs. Uh, Olds and his formation began a legendary dogfight where U.S. forces exploited their tactical and technical advantage over the enemy. Within 13 minutes, seven MiGs were destroyed, which was roughly half the NVA MiG-21 fleet. The Americans hauled ass back to Thailand with zero casualties. Wow. Olds was a badass, man. He was a triple ace. You imagine how long? Was he really? 13 minutes. Yeah, he was our last ace. Combined a total of 17 victories. Damn. Yeah, triple ace. Jeez. Did he make general? He was uh, retired as Brigadier General in 1973. After 30 years of service. Wow, good on him. That's cool. That dude was a badass. Yeah. Um, and we should know more about him. You know, especially Air Force guys, we should know more about him. Oh, you know where he died? Much. Here's a no. piece for you. He died in uh, June 14th of 2007 at the age of 74 in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Oh, must have been a ski bum. Buried at the Air Force Academy Cemetery. Damn these old pilots, man! They just like they—they they don't know how to stop. They just That's keep going cool. adventure, right? Yeah. Good on you, General. Uh, okay, eight Battle of Mogadishu. Of course, Ooh, what we're gonna do is Black, watch, Hawk, Black Hawk, Hawk down for that. Black right? Hawk down. Uh, two two Congressional Medal of Honor came out of that for the two snipers. Um, don't want to recap 
Black Hawk Down. I think that's pretty fresh in all our memories. <laughs> Number nine, Iwo Jima. Wow, Damn. that's cool. Uh, in the final stretch of World War II, the Allies sought to gain control of strategic islands in the Pacific. Iwo Jima uh, is located roughly 660 miles from Japan, making it an ideal forward deployed location for the Axis and Allied powers alike. Over 21,000 Japanese were there to greet the Marines uh, when they came in, when they landed on the shores, heavily entrenched in a complex network of underground tunnels and artillery positions. What followed was some of the most violent fighting of the Pacific in World War II, due in large part to the determination of the Japanese to die before they would surrender. But Iwo Jima had the iconic raising of the American flag over Mount Suribachi. Uh, in the end, nearly all the Japanese defenders were killed except for a couple hundred prisoners. Over 6,000 Americans died, helping to take the island with 17,000 more wounded. Wow. Mm. I didn't realize the numbers were that big. That's amazing. That's huge. And then last on their list is, of course, D-Day. So we don't need to go watch uh, Sam Private Ryan. Um, <laughs> but uh, I thought that was a pretty good rundown of some pretty – uh, significant battles there. Some of some of which I didn't know. Operation Bolo and the right. Sagan Valley. I didn't know that one. Um, but some of the other numbers are just you know it's it's crazy. It's amazing. So thought we'd take a little interjection there to uh, uh, inv- ad- advance our knowledge of history. I like it. <laughs> uh, okay, now for some current news. Jake, what's going on with the submersible? Yeah, so that's submersible, man. It's off the coast. <clears throat> Looking at the Titanic, right? And it's it went missing like Sunday morning. They lost contact. That with was it. like last contact, right? Yep. And but the military aspect of this is the whole response relies basically on the Coast Guard right. and the actions they're taking. So they're getting. They've estimated, they've done all the math, estimating how much breathable air they're still out there searching. Um, so it's, but they they said that they're not going to stop searching them immediately after the estimate lapses. Wow. Uh, Waiting for air to run, run out, man. It's just oh, crazy. Man, it's, yeah. Mm. The air will last longer than the batteries, which is, uh, even worse to be yeah, to be in the yeah. dark. Oh God! Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. cra- it's crazy for us to speculate because you know every minute we're talking, they're losing more air until yeah. something happens. But um, yeah, I, I just uh, uh, I had heard that it's there's basically three passengers, a pilot, and uh, like a artifact expert or something, a mission yeah. specialist. So there's five people on it. But the three paying passengers I had heard was two hundred and fifty thousand uh a piece. Jeez, man. To, man. Be honored, to go down to the Titanic, right? That kind of money to have that kind of problem. Oh that's horrific. Well, that's uh you know, that's uh trip to Disneyland. They're like, Yeah, let's go see Disneyland. Okay, we've seen it. Yeah, let's go see a Titanic. All right. Hey, you know, <laughs> and next and next we'll go contact All SpaceX. Right. See if we can go out yeah. uh, outer space. So I but mean, this, that's not so something you save news, up, right? Yeah, I don't know. Horrible. Man. So this, this article um, said that the since the submit went, went missing, the Coast Guard, Canadian Coast Guard, U.S. Navy, and Air National Guard have searched a combined area of about 7,600 square miles. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ooh. I'm like, man, that's crazy. Just the combined... Can you imagine organizing all this? Oh, yeah. The, well, uh, the amount, organizing scale. air support, organizing, yeah. Right. But, I mean, 7,600 square miles in, in the ocean, is it seems like nothing, though, right? Yeah. I mean, it's huge. But on it's land, it's nothing. the state of Connecticut. Oh, shit. That's a good perspective. Yeah. 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 It's nothing where they're at, you know? Well, I just remember Tom Hanks doing his figuring when he's like, oh, right. oh yeah. They're basically searching the size of Texas. So. Yeah. What do you think, Wilson? Yeah, they're not going to find it. <laughs> We're stuck. Yeah. So, yeah, they sent uh, a C-130 uh, or two C-130s. I don't know what they're going to do. Just fly around, I suppose. Um, and three C-17s. That was sent from U.S. Transportation Command. 
Um, they also sent, oh, this is funny because now everybody wants to get in on it, right? So in addition yeah. to the U.S. Transportation Command C-130s, New York Governor Kathy Hochul announced in a press release that one HC-130J Combat King search and rescue aircraft from the New York Air National Guard's 106th Rescue Wing deployed to the area Monday and was returning there Tuesday as well. And they, they had another paragraph about how she was proud of the And that's their National whole Guard. job, though. I know, I know. Like, that's, that's what they train for and get paid for. It. But it's, it's like she wants to go, hey, New York National Guard sent a plane. Like, it's yeah. about New York. It's Thank about you, New York. Thank you, Governor. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Uh, let's say a Navy spokesman said that this that the Navy is sending subject matter experts and a flyaway deep ocean salvage system, uh, which is FADOS, F A D O S S, flyaway deep ocean salvage system to help with search and rescue. Um, Navy salvage experts previously described the FADOS as a portable motion compensated lift system connected through the ship's crane boom that can be used to bring objects up from the ocean floor. So what's the depth that this submersible is supposed to be at or the Titanic is supposed to be at? Did you run across oh, that? Man, I got, no, I didn't see I it. can, I can get that for you. I think it's oh. 15, 14,000 feet. That's it. 14,000 <laughs> feet. Right. Um, but until in 2021, the team set a salv salvage depth record recovered an MH-60S helicopter from a depth of 19,000 feet off the coast of Okinawa, Japan. So mm -hmm. they got, they can, they can get there uh, as long as they know where there is. But I guess, I guess you start hovering over the Titanic, right? And just start. You know, it's 370 nautical miles down. 370. Really? Yes, that's what that comes out to. Three hundred and seventy nautical miles. That's insane. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That can't be right. Because Denver's fifty-two eighty, right? One mile up. Five thousand two hundred eighty-five. All right. So how much? What's twenty-one? That's three miles. What's twenty-one hundred fathoms? Oh God. <laughs> So you're right. Uh, it was three hundred. It's about, it's about uh, twenty-eight thousand acres. It's three hundred and seventy. Another miles. unit of measure. I have no it's idea about. Three hundred and seventy miles off Newfoundland, Canada. Oh, That's it's what, away from the coast. My bad. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's right. twenty-one hundred fathoms down. Well, fourteen thousand feet, I guess, is roughly three miles down, right? Hmm. Which is always weird when you're talking about depth of the ocean or like outer space. You know, you go oh, a yeah. mile and all of a sudden you're a big risk, you know? Yeah. So um, so they got it. I guess uh, you just go to the Titanic and start there, right? Start dropping things down and go, sure. hey, can we find yeah. anything, I suppose? Well, yeah, that's crazy. Well, let's hope a miracle happens. But uh, yeah, we're already on Tuesday when we're recording this. And they were two days ago. They lost, what they say? Originally they had 96 hours of air. Yeah. They estimated that they got they got about forty hours left. Oh man, that's just terrible. But yeah, as soon as the coast guard, yeah, like they said, hey, we're not going to give up at that forty hours, but we're just <laughs> right. letting you guys know. Yeah. Oh man, Marty, you were right. It's two point three nine miles down. Oh, two point three. Okay. You're you're correct. My apologies. Don't give him that. Don't give. Him. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't correcting all that viciously. Not at all. <laughs> I was about to say 379 miles down. That sounds just retarded. <laughs> just how in the hell? You're like through the earth and out out the back oh, of the yeah. moon. I, at that I'm at the I'm at the core. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's oh, hope shit. they didn't go that far. So, <laughs> um, okay. I think we should go into which what we haven't done in a while is our all military selection. So, mm. we have one news story, but we're going into all military selection. Selection. So uh, our last one was the aircraft carrier won by nobody. So we had a consensus <laughs> on the aircraft carrier. That was the USS Enterprise CV six. <laughs> Should I go down our winners just for people who haven't been following Bill very good? 
Mm. Our all military selection battleship, the USS New Jersey. Uh, tank was the M4 Sherman. Fighter jet was the F-15 Eagle. Uh, rifle yeah. was the Spencer rifle. Uh, the Air Force General was Hap Arnold. The all military dog, Sergeant <laughs> Stubby Baby. <laughs> the all military animal, Staff Sergeant Reckless. Oh. <laughs> not, oh. Not the Camel Douglas. It's yeah. all Douglas. Although Douglas gets more play on here than any other animal, that's for sure. <laughs> he keeps popping up. That is true. Uh, the all military machine gun was the M2 because Jake couldn't think of the minigun. Uh, <laughs> the gal. The, 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 the all military propeller bomber was a B 17. Uh, with, the, with honorable mention B 36. No, not honorable mention. <laughs> no mention. Uh, the Marine General was General Smedley Butler. That's still badass. That story is still awesome. Mm. Uh, and the aircraft carrier was the USS Enterprise. So tonight we're doing the all-military handgun. All right. So yes. the one who actually won, uh, not last or not the last time we did it, but the uh, the one that we actually did was Jake. So Jake, you get to go last. All right. All right. Uh, what do you think, uh, Eric? Pick a number. Uh, <laughs> All right, you go first. All right. Gentlemen, I want to introduce you to a hell of a handgun. Right from the get-go, my nomination is the Beretta M9. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? Otherwise known as the World Defender. Okay? The World Defender? World what? Defender. Who Rightfully who, earned who the named nickname it World Defender? of World Defender. Okay? He named it that. It was voted on that. by Eric Perrot. Um... <laughs> all right, all right. Let let me proceed, please. All right, <laughs> all right. So this legendary semi-automatic handgun has been in service since 1985. Consists of single and double action. Has a 15 round capacity. It's got a 4.9 inch barrel and of course the caliber is nine millimeter it is a stopper all right it's been in service since 1985. uh this thing was first went out in 85 and had to go through some serious testing uh it was passed at the firing range the demands of the u.s military far exceeded most conditions in which a handgun is used and even here the m9 delivered Per <laughs> testing guidelines, this pistol was capable of firing 10 shot groups of three inches or less at a distance of 50 meters. I'm thinking I could probably stop right there. That's amazing, right? <laughs> That's a tight grouping that I don't think you boys are going to be able to handle. The M9 offers a variety of tactical features that make it equally safe, easy to use, and dependable in the holster of military personnel. Its reversible magazine release enables use of either hand for tactical magazine chains with dexterity. While it's an ambidextrous safety decocker, makes the pistol flexible for right or left-handed guys So, and gals. Goes both ways. Um, <laughs> Not the ejection <laughs> port. <laughs> you can't flip the ejection port on that thing. No, but it's talking about um, the safety, turning on or off. Yeah, all right. Yeah. All right, continue. All right. Um, has, has fought in many of the conflicts, ranging from uh, Kosovo all the way up to the uh, conflict in the Middle East. So it's a showstopper and a hell of a weapon. And by the way, I own one. <laughs> oh. So just say. What was standard issue? How big was the magazine in? Ten rounds. Ten rounds? Yeah. Right. And they had magazines that could take you all the way up to 15. Yeah, sure. You could get extent. That's why I asked it just a standard issue. Yeah. I couldn't remember how many went in. So, so and the Air Force, not, not talking for the Army or the Marines or Navy, uh, we went from a wheel gun. So you had six rounds with two 
two six uh, uh, reloads in your your belt. So what's that? Eighteen rounds. So this thing in uh, ten. So you went up from eighteen to thirty rounds, which you allowed you issue. What what weapon were you issued? A Smith and Wesson thirty eight. Holy shit! That, how, how come they didn't give you the nineteen eleven? Well, I, ask the Air Force. I don't know. We had the <laughs> Smith and Wesson 38. Wow. You had six rounds in, and then you had the two speed feeders. Yeah. Uh, the reloaders. So, yeah, six twelve. You know when I learned about the Beretta? Was from was from Lethal Weapon. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, cool. yeah, <laughs> yeah. And if you watch that scene where he he ama- he marvels at the Beretta. He really doesn't say anything about it. He's like, wide ejection port, no feed jams. <laughs> like, okay, that's it. <laughs> I mean, this thing has done it all. Um, went through impossibly rigorous durability and reliability tests that greatly exceed in any kind of real life situation. And it has passed them all with oh, flying colors. On, it keeps boy. functioning in temperatures Paid as low as minus Beretta. 40, minus 40, and as high as 140. And it consistently fires over 35,000 rounds of commercial ammunition before a failure. <laughs> Keeps functioning reliably even after being buried in the sand or snow or being All repeatedly right. dropped on Stop hard surfaces in the back like the asphalt box. and concrete. Just say. <laughs> My selection, the M9 Beretta, the future, the wave. Wow, uh, until, until I got replaced no, it's by not the, the future. It, yeah, it's just got replaced the but, <laughs> but you know what? It was funny. I, I started looking at that. The Army is the only branch that felt that the M9 had um, slide failures that no, actually no. resulted in the injury of like four soldiers. And that well, was what, because what they were the they ones started doing it the most, right? Well, we're talking about the army here. They probably didn't know how to pull the slide back oh, without hurting themselves. Oh, that's <laughs> enough, Eric. There's, there's always that story. I don't know if it's a real thing or an urban legend, but I guess one of the safety features on the Beretta is that if you push up on the barrel, it disengages and it won't fire. Oh, like if you push the end of it into a wall or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, I see. When Okay. The, so that's one of the safety, safety. features, right. I guess, right? right. Hmm. There's a story, and I don't know if it's true or not, about two cops just messing around watching the flight line. And one said, oh, yeah, do you think this actually works? And pushed it down on his buddy's leg and shot. And oh, pushed man. down hard enough. For hard enough, <laughs> so it was still able to fire. Oh, my God. Tell me that wasn't an Air Force cop. <laughs> that's, uh, that's who I heard it was, but I don't oh, know no. if it's true or not. But oh, given enough time and boredom, that's, that's bound to happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Eric, step aside. I've got the Colt 1911A1. All right. Uh, the first automatic magazine fed pistol adopted by the U.S. Army. Uh, it is a single action semi automatic recoil operated pistol chambered for the 45 caliber ACP. Uh, let's see. It came into service. Where did it come into service? Shit. A long time ago. A long time ago. But it was actually redesigned. Uh, it came into service before World War I. Uh, but it was actually redesigned in 24 with some slight modification to become. The 1911A1. So it was a primary service pistol of the U.S. Army, Navy, and Marines by World War II. And a bunch of people manufactured that thing. So what? Everybody knows the 1911. But you know what made the 1911 the best? It's four (laughs) things that made it the best, right? So more than 100 years old and going strong. How the iconic 1911 still remains among the best pistol options. Why? One is because of the trigger. 1911 continues. Yeah, it has no trigger. Oh, sorry. Among its greatest assets, the 1911 trigger <laughs> is one of the best in the pistol world. Designed to travel straight backward, the trigger helps keep the sights in line during this critical stage of breaking a shot. There is no play or pivot to it, just smooth, linear travel. So, trigger, <laughs> number one. It, right? it is the very distinct part of its look. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. If you if you yeah. look at a 1911, that trigger is filled behind, you know, where right. everything normally has a gap. 
Right, right. And it's it's a very unique look. And it is a smooth trigger pull. So uh, the second thing is the frame. The frame, uh, in contemporary handguns, polymer frames are king, are king but uh, there is something to the metal frame uh, of the 1911. So you have to something. carry a little bit heavier <laughs> pistol, but that gun, that weight plays a large role in how much recoil it produces. In turn, shooters generally contend with less muzzle flip with a 1911, especially the heavier commander and government models. I have a government 1911, and it is steady. It's heavy, but it's steady as she ain't. So even aluminum frame lightweight commander tips the scales considerably more than the most comparable polymers. And it's durability because it is that cold, hard steel. So there is, you know, still juries out on how durable the polymer ones will be. But mm. the 1911 is over 100 years old, and most of them are still functional. I, I got to admit, I like the gun. When we first yeah. talked about this, Marty, I was the 1911's a badass gun. Uh, I know it is. You, 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 you made a, you made your case, but now you got to go to bed with your M9. So too bad. <laughs> Uh, accuracy is another reason. So, what were you talking about? Those shot groupings? Oh, here we go. Uh, I'm still saying the nine mil will take that down. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the Colt 1911 easily put 2.5 inch five shot groups of 25 yards from the box, if not better. So, I did 10 shot groups of three inches or less at a distance of 50 meters approximately 55 yards with consistency and reliability and a decreased muzzle velocity at that 50 yards. So it's just going to ding off of whatever. Arm <laughs> 45. No, 45, Good try. Good 45 try. knocking you down, even if it doesn't <laughs> penetrate. Right. And another feature of it is the ergonomics of it because it's that single stack magazine. Uh, your hand fits around that thing and it feels Great, you know it feels really a good part of your part of your hand, and you can control it. That that plays into its accuracy. Says the army guy. Says anybody who's held a 1911. <laughs> well, so, all right. I rest my case. Okay, so first of all, cold hard steel check. <laughs> Long history check. Right, you guys wouldn't be here at all if it weren't for the Colt Single Action Army, also known as the Colt Peacemaker, the M1873. This is nice. the pistol six shot revolver in service 1873 to 1892, used by multiple nations uh, and mainly used to win over the West. It is so, the gun that won the West, right? Yep, it is the gun that won the West. So it was used in the American Indian Wars all the way up to World War II. Damn. God, it was that long? It was yep. in World War II? It's, it's still, yeah, it was still being used the whole time. What wow. caliber was it? So I, initially, which is super cool, initially it was made to caliber to hold the same round as the Henry rifle. Oh, that's, oh, that's so smart. that yeah. so that Henry rifle is the long, you know, the famous mm -hmm. um, rifle that everybody used in all the westerns and everything. Yeah. But it was a forty-four rimfire. Oh, nice. um, damn! Yeah, yeah, rimfire too, though. Yeah, that's kind of cool. That's so awesome. that's what it originally came off as, and then it switched to the forty-five, oh, okay. and then. Over the years, because it's been in service for so long, it's been chambered for 38, 32, 38 oh, yeah. long, yeah. 22, yeah. you know, that all that 38 special. Mm. Um, but it is the original gunslinging Colt revolver of choice. So six rounds, six rounds only. Um, there's a lot of John Wayne movies to prove his accuracy is way better than either one of you schmucks. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty sure I've seen Tombstone. That's right. And That's right. Val Kilmer was wrecking people with with 
Colt <laughs> Peacemaker. Oh no, that was no, uh, it was Kurt. Uh, I know, I'm Kurt. just messing. With you. <laughs> you guys are like, no, how dare you? It was a, <laughs> Fact Val check was me by the... quoting a movie. That was Doc Holliday on the Street Houser. The Street Houser, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Shotgun. Yeah. Uh, was it? It was single action, right? It was single action. Yeah. Nice. Hmm. So you had to pull that hammer back and then every time, right? When did that, what was it when they pulled it out of service? They officially took it out of service. Um, sorry, let me go back to that. I can't remember. You said up in the World War II, right? Yeah. So it was officially out of service in 1892. Oh, okay. But. People it were was, still carrying. Yeah, people were still people carrying, were still carrying them right. all the way up to World War II. That's yeah. pretty amazing. Well, you got a, a gun that won the West. You got uh, an iconic 1911 <laughs> that <laughs> was in service basically all the way up until <laughs> was was the 1911 the what the Beretta replaced? No, I don't think so. Like I told you, we re, we replaced the uh, Smith and Wesson 38. Well, yeah, no. because you got just hand me downs. That's what I was. Air Force, man. I, you know, <laughs> can I tell you? You're like, if these guys need more than six shots, they need more than the Air Force. I think uh, didn't the Army and the Marines hang on to the 1911 past the Beretta for a little while? Uh, I don't. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I didn't go into that history. Uh, like when all services accepted it, right? Uh, but it's possible. You know, it's possible. So, and now mm. they're all into the six. So we'll see how yeah. those those work out. But I don't know. That's a pretty good. Uh, that's a pretty good fight. Maybe we should leave that up to some comments because I can't decide on that one. Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, all three all three weapons have their advantages for sure. So all who's listening out there, please let us know in the comments what you would choose: the uh, Peacemaker, the 1911, or the M9 Beretta. Boo. Who so, are? Boo. Who are? <laughs> I'd personally be okay with the 1911 or the piece. Beretta. I get it. Yeah. I, no. I think so too. I mean, uh, I mean, the Beretta was good. It was very. Is it? Is it made by? It. Is it Italian made? Beretta. Yes, I think Beretta is Italian. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, the same mentality goes with Italian cars versus american cars i mean you're all flash but when it comes down to actual use oh goodness here we it's go pure, it's like a lamborghini countach it looks good on a poster but it's straight dog shit oh, anywhere God. else <laughs> yeah you're not driving that up to the mountains <laughs> yeah exactly same thing with the beretta no i don't you guys are killing me here man <laughs> gotta stop that uh, okay, so listeners, let us know. Uh, I think that's end up, gentlemen. That sounds like end a good up. episode to me. Yeah, like one news story, but uh, sometimes news is slow. So. <laughs> yeah, we had all the Waterloo, and I mean, it was a good run. Yeah. Right. Some Waterloo action, have a reference. <laughs> On behalf of all of us here, I'd like to thank you for listening today. Please like, share, subscribe, and let us know how we did in the comments. And please vote for your all military handgun. And as always, make sure to download the next episode for more service headline news. Man, thanks for the week, and I'll see you next week. Good night, guys. Good night, guys. Oh, and Eric, I'm sorry for keeping you late. I know you're uh, you're late for your (laughs) ass cover band rehearsal. (laughs) Oh, my God. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.